So I'm Mac, and tonight I'm going to present Passive DNS for Fun and Profit. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into who I am and, and the presentation. Um, but I want to kind of just make an upfront disclaimer is I work in the passive DNS industry. I sell passive DNS. This is by no stretch an attempt for me to sell you passive DNS. However, I'm going to explain in depth what it is and, and parts of how, use, how, how it's used for red teams, for blue teams, for researchers. Um, and it's kind of a, a two-part presentation. Um, the second part, which I'll give on another night, is more like practical examples. But what I've found in my time is I've gone to a number of passive DNS presentations by a number of different vendors. And every time they say, well, this is what you can do with passive DNS, and they show me one or two examples that may or may not be useful to my environment or may or may not make sense at a larger level, and it was probably or more than anything because I didn't understand passive DNS. So um, I'm going to start with that. There is, however, a small disclaimer in that any opinion, viewpoint, thought, observation, dissertation, or hallucination expressed in this presentation that makes one feel uncomfortable, provokes thoughts, borders on controversy, is different from or contrary to the opinion of anyone in the audience, or is proven to be factually incorrect at a future point in time, should not be misconstrued, taken out of context, judged to be intentionally injurious, or assumed to be delivered with malice, but should instead be viewed as a good faith effort on the part of the presenter to inform, educate, and incite discussion between all the entities and individuals for who for some unknown reason hated themselves enough to be employed within or interested in the asymmetric and seemingly unwinnable fight that is the practice of information security. TLDR, I'm going to share some information that I've learned professionally <laughs> and personally that hopefully makes your professional or personal life a little bit better. Um, I do, though, however, want to thank my employer real quick and the fact that they let me use company resources and company time to put these presentations together and not as a sales tactic but actually encourage me to go out and find groups like this um, here in Phoenix and around the country and just educate people on both passive DNS and information security in general. So um, thanks to them for that. Um, so who am I? And this is the Linux users group meeting so hopefully the uh, top line is uh, understandable. Um, I work for a company called Open Source Context. We are a purveyor of the finest passive DNS information um, that exists, in my opinion. We have a little over 600 billion records collected, and we're adding to that at about 10 million records a second. Um, I've been an information security practicer or practitioner officially uh, for the better part of the past decade, uh, somewhere between eight and nine years. Before that, I was a systems administrator. Um, I did Linux administration for Middle Tennessee State University. We focused on both uh, you know, infrastructure stuff um, as well as we ran a large computational science and mathematical science uh, cluster, 700 nodes-ish. Um, and that's actually where I learned Linux. And um, I tortured myself in my early career as a Windows systems administrator and desktop uh, uh, technician. I'm not real sure why, but uh, I did it. Um, I'm also a former NCO um, in the Army. And um, I am a supposed rarity in the InfoSec uh, industry because I'd rather spend time with people than computers, um, which I guess is a little bit weird. But um, that's for me. So I'm going to start with blockchain. What is it good for? Cryptocurrency, that's it, right? Everybody's trying to sell a blockchain solution. So this is like my personal rant and maybe highly controversial. Um, the amount of time it takes to try and find a supposed solution and then the computational power it is for that solution is probably better spent on like the really basic part of information security of blocking and tackling, like knowing what your firewall rules are doing, making sure that your DNS is operating properly. And you know, everybody hates to say it, but you've got to have some kind of malware solution, even if it's just for compliance, right? So let's get to the meat of the presentation. What is passive DNS? It's really a historical DNS record, right? And I guess it's really defined as a collection of observed DNS metadata stored in a manner which allows retrieval at a later point in time. But it's simply a, a database of observed DNS events. So really, what is, power, or is, is passive DNS? Let's go through the whole presentation. I think you'll have a much clearer understanding. But it was introduced by Florian Weimer at the first conference, um, which is Forum of Internet Response, or Response and Security Teams, or Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams in 2005. And it's not blockchain, like not even close. And I'll start with the architecture of it. So 
Passive DNS is made up of four different pieces. You've got to have sensors. Um, sensors are just that. They, they see what the passive DNS is. You have to have analyzers. Um, anybody want to you know, fathom a guess of you know, how many different DNS queries you can issue? 7,000? I, I don't know. It's, it's, there are you know, probably 40 different types of, D, 50 different types of DNS records. There's, there's actually a lot of them, right? So um, not all DNS events are created equal because we have DNS and then we have eDNS and then we have DNS sec secured records and all of those queries and responses, even if you're querying an, just an A record, right? An A record query for, uh, on an eDNS um, looks very differently, very different on the wire than an A record for just simple DNS. And then it looks different yet again if you're going to ask for a DNS sec uh, version of that. So you have to have analyzers to actually determine what the queries are. And I guess I really probably should have asked, anybody use passive DNS in here before? <coughs> Sweet. Um, you have to have a data store, right? Because if you're going to collect data, and you want to do something with it later, you obviously have to put it somewhere. And that's probably one of the most complicated pieces to this and where we'll spend a good chunk of time. And then you have to have a query mechanism, right? Because if you're going to store it, it's not really going to be any good to you if you can't uh, ask questions of it later. So we'll start with sensors. So sensors play the eyes and ears of the passive DNS operation, right? And you can have any number of different types of sensors, um, but they sit on the wire, if you will. And I guess they can be wireless if you want, but most DNS servers tend to be you know, hardwired infrastructure. And it's really just going to collect the DNS metadata as it passes by. This happens in IDS events, uh, or your IDS sensors, IPS sensors. It happens at your firewall, because you, know, you may or may not la allow DNS through, and that can happen. Obviously, you can allow port 53, um, UDP and TCP, if you want to do it that way. Or if you have one of the fancy next-gen firewalls, you, know, you can look at layer 7 and actually say, no, I'm not just going to let TCP UDP 53 through. I'm only going to let TCP UDP 53 that match DNS through. Right. Um, so there are a number of different sensors um, that can be used. Um, in when you're building a passive DNS system or you're buying a passive DNS system, um, Generally, you're going to use custom-built sensors um, to watch the wire and that are just very efficient at understanding DNS and only DNS, and then that's all they do. Um, and you can run these sensors in a variety of places. But the location of the sensor must be carefully considered based on the goals of your operation. And we're going to kind of get into that in the fact that um, what are your motives for wanting passive DNS? So, are your motives for wanting passive DNS to maintain some privacy, yet add some security or information to your organization? Um, if that's the case, you're going to have to place your sensor somewhere between your recursive resolver, your last state of the recursive resolver, and your network edge. Otherwise, you will be tying DNS queries to individuals versus uh, logging them just as DNS events. However, if you're in a highly regu regulated environment, a uh, highly controlled environment, you, you may want maximum data collection. And in that case, you can uh, put the sensor between the client and the recursive resolver somewhere at a network choke point, at, at an uplink, um, if you will. Um, you can actually run the sensor if you want on your recursive resolver itself, if you've got enough horsepower and, and bandwidth to do that. But you want to be careful of unintended consequences because if you're a 5,000 person organization and you decide that you want maximum data collection and you put your sensor right there between your clients and your recursive resolver, how many Google events do you think you're going to collect on a daily basis? <laughs> and how many of those Google events do you think are going to be useful? Right? And you need to think about that because it's not just the fact that you're collecting those. You're going to collect them. You're going to push them back to your analyzers. You're going to push them back to your data store. And then it's going to be things that you have to sort through later when you're asking your data store questions through your query mechanism. right? So the law of unintended consequences will get you with your sensor placement. If you think that maximum data collection is your goal, I would caution you against that. Um, I've, I've learned in a couple of places from experience that you can uh, take 
what would normally be a, a, a fifty or sixty thousand dollar build for an organizational level passive DNS system and bring it into the several million dollar build uh, arena just in the infrastructure to analyze store and query those uh, you know the the events that are honestly probably next to meaningless not only that generally when DNS events are issued within the organization, you have some kind of internal facing DNS, right? Most organizations run a split horizon um, DNS, which is very interesting in the world of passive DNS because you will see how many people do it badly. Um, but you really don't care about all your 10 dot records that come back or your RFC 1918 space, right? All your internal DNS uh, resolutions don't necessarily give you uh, any kind of an outward projection of security in some sense when you're, when you're trying to triage malware events, right? So um, look and think about what your goals are um, when you're collecting these DNS records. The, anal uh, the, the analyzers, you need to match query requests with query responses, right? So I send out uh, a DNS query uh, for google.com. I should get back a 174, dot, what, 174, 225, 16 type address, I think is, is the primary Google. Um, they change it from time to time. But you should be getting uh, an address back, right? And the thing about you issuing DNS queries is there is a point at which a DNS query is, is issued and doesn't get an answer that is interesting, right? But generally, when we issue a DNS query, it's because we are looking for some kind of resource. And if it's a malware, uh, a piece of malware that's issuing that DNS request, obviously, we want to be able to pair that DNS request with the proper response and bring it back so that when we query it, we're not going to say, well, uh, we think that the malware issued this query, and we think that the query was issued for hotmail.com, and when in fact it was issued for some other domain. So that's part of the role of your analyzers is to actually properly you know, match those requests back up. You'll want to parse the, the query for additional metadata, right? Is it an eDNS query? Um, is it an MX record query? Is it an A record query? Is it a quad A record query? Um, is it an any record query? Uh, there are a number of different types of queries that you can issue for a number of different records, right? So um, commonly, we publish these big, large records um, in uh, base 64 or, or text records, right, for things like SPF and DMARC and DCAM and all that stuff, right? Those are different requests. You're, you're digging a text record um, when you're issuing those requests versus looking for an A or a quad A record, right? And then you have to transmit that parse data to uh, the data storage system. So you have to have um, several points of capacity on your analyzers. You have to be able to receive the data, so you have to have enough bandwidth to get it in, and you have to have enough processing power to actually listen for the data to come in. Then you have to have enough power uh, and processing to be able to either analyze it right there or transfer it into an, uh, yeah, what's up? Oh, uh, just, was, do you ever capture path data, like uh, uh, trace route uh, type information for where the DNS response came from or how it got back to you? You, you can, I don't. Um, not not, not in what I've seen. Maybe I'd have to think. Um, I, I may have seen it. I don't recall it off the top of my head. I don't know of anybody who's actually commercially selling that path data. Um, just, just thinking with all the BGP uh, kind of uh, games that are going on, that it might be uh, useful to have that part of the metadata. Well, you know, interestingly enough, open source context actually has a a passive BGP. Uh, data store where we basically run a historical looking glass. That's a separate thing. I'm sure at some point in my life around here, I'll come and present that as well. Um, I, I think the biggest reason that nobody does it is we're looking at 10 million packets a second just of DNS, right? So if I were to try and put all the metadata with the pathing of that back, it would, I mean, it would be just an exponentially harder game to play and store, and I'm not sure exactly the value um, that would come from that. Um, 
One of the other things that, especially like commercial passive DNS services do, is um, you try and spread your sensor network very wide, right? So our company has agreements with large ISPs and with uh, large recursive resolver operators and other places around the globe um, and, and large infrastructure operators to be able to simply just listen for DNS requests and say there was a request issued and here was the response that matched. We, we don't care who issued it. We don't care where, you know, how it came back. We just know that it matches. And one of the interesting things that you'll see, especially with things like um, CDNs, and part of the reason that if you build it at an organizational level versus buy it from a vendor, one of the things that you may or may not be able to get is that if you don't have a physical infrastructure presence um, to, to listen in, uh, we'll just say Great Britain, right, versus the United States. When you're looking at something that is delivered by a Cloudflare or an Akamai or something like that, you're going to actually get different results in Great Britain than you are going to get from here. So if you don't have, uh, if you just build it at an organizational level and you don't have coverage in all of those places, you're actually going to get a more limited view. So one of the things that we did as a company, and just to, to, to throw it out there, is when we started building the sensor network, we, we really worked hard to build a global view um, of what it is. So um, there are several times where I'll pull uh, a domain record out of our data and I'll have hundreds, um, if not thousands, uh, of different uh, answers for that. Some of it is because it changed over time, but you will look that in the same three minute time slice, sometimes I'll get 50 different answers and that's because it's hosted on something like an Akamai and it's very regionally specific as to where you go to get that information. So um, hopefully that answered your question. So once you receive the data from the sensor, right, you have to hand it off to analyzers of, of some sort. So you have to have the, the power to analyze that data and then you have to hand that off to some kind of process that transmit it. Now it could be all the same Python script or, or whatever you want, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be three independent processes, but you have to have the capacity to be able to do all of those things. And then you have to have the bandwidth going back out to whatever your data store is. Um, so one of the places that you can quickly get into trouble in architecting and building this is that you say, well, I'm going to analyze 6,000 DNS queries a second, um, and you do testing on 100 DNS queries a second, and then you do testing on 500 DNS queries a second, and you get a scale set, and you say, okay, in order to deploy for 6,000 a second, I need this much processing power. Um, and you deploy that out and you start getting some kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a queuing, right? You're, you're getting a backlog. Or you had all the processing power in the world, but because you only have a 10 megabit link between whatever it is, you start running out. So you have to really look at that capacity and understand that um, if you're going to add 1,000 queries per second, you're really going to have to add 2,000 queries per second um, or maybe even a little bit more of bandwidth and processing set because you're going to have to do things multiple times, right, in and out. So, and then this is the piece that probably gets most people into trouble. And when I say data storage, I don't mean some large server right because putting a bunch of disks together and having space to store the query well that's pretty easy but being able to retrieve it from that that's a lot more complicated so you're not going to just put that on flat file and disk because you're not going to be able to retrieve it fast enough so you're going to have to have some kind of a database right it could be sql it could be uh you know elastic search it could be hadoop it could be splunk it could be I don't know, 10,000 different things, right? Um, you know, put it in your elk stack. But the thing about that is um, you're going to have to have the coordinating bandwidth in that data storage. So you're going to have to be able to continue to um, throw uh, queries into your data store simultaneously as pulling or, or throwing the DNS metadata into your data store simultaneous to querying it. But you're also going to have to have the disk speed, the bandwidth speed, and the processing speed when you get to more than one system to ensure that replication happens, um, the deconfliction of work. So right, if you're going to issue a query out to uh, 100 different Elasticsearch nodes to get this done, you're going to have to have uh, capacity to be able to coordinate the, the work slicing that's done um, and, and the replication factors that go over. So that's generally where people start to get into trouble because they say, well, um, 
we're we're going to we're going we're going we're going to architect this for our organization and we want to be able to keep 2 years of passive dns data so it requires this much disk and this is our processing volume that needs to happen however their disks pass 50% and coordination starts taking longer and longer because you're starting to have to, to spread it out in different manners and your, your mapping algorithms become more complex. And as your disks approach 80%, your performance bottles back, or bottlenecks back again. So your data storage is generally where people get into um, the most trouble because the other part is a developer says, you know what, I can optimize this query and I can make this query that much faster. And they do, but they don't see any kind of speed increase other than issuing the query because they've still got storage problems, whether it's there's too few disks across the number of servers or too few servers or not enough bandwidth between the servers, whatever it is, there's a hundred different ways that things can go wrong in your data storage layer. So that's probably technically the hardest um, of these to actually get right and properly size. And we all know that, you know, it doesn't get any bigger when we deploy something, right? Because, you know, those, those links never change and the number of, of DNS queries, you know, only go, uh, stay constant, right? Yeah. So in that respect, are you writing to the disks faster than querying the disks? What is the ratio? De depends on your organization, right? Like, are you talking uh, about- Typically from your, from, from from your experience with the different uh, uh, locations where you have- Yeah, I, 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 I don't know the actual breakdown. I guess I could get with my systems engineers and, and find it, but I would suspect um, at we're not issuing 10, 000, or 10 million queries a second um, at, at what we're doing, um, although we are adding records at approximately 10 million a second, right? So we're gonna do more write to disk than we do read from disk. Um, that being said, we're not a super large passive DNS provider at this point, right? So as we get more clients, we'll see what it goes. But I think ideally, you would probably always be doing more collection than query, right? Um, and then the fourth and final portion of the architecture is the actual query mechanism itself. Um, I'm, I'm a systems engineer <laughs> by trade, not a developer. Um, I, can, I can write enough Python to be dangerous um, and, and screw things up poorly. And I can write some Elasticsearch queries, but they're by no means efficient. And, and I'm glad I have an, a team behind me that actually takes care of this. But this, this is a layer that, in some ways, it's the, the, the easiest to scale and change and replace, right? Because you can write an API um, and to your users, that API may never change, but you could change it 100 times on the back end, right? But the structure of what you issue at it doesn't change. So from an end user standpoint, this is the thing that probably actually changes the most, but doesn't change at all, i.e., I use the same interface, the same web interface, the same uh, uh, you know, HTTP post or, or whatever it is, my API, in order to issue my request. But on the back side, this is where you can get huge efficiency gains and you can do things like, okay, we're just gonna load balance this and we're gonna have multiple query servers, right? So in a lot of ways, it's the easiest to actually scale um, because it's the one thing that is probably the most inside of your control. Um, in a sense of you can control how many people are, are getting access to it, right? And you can control um, where those query points are. Um, generally, as a security team, you don't have control over the new branch office that stands up um, in California or in Washington, D.C. Or, or wherever your next branch office uh, stands up that adds more queries to it. You don't control the next web application that your company puts out um, or whatever it is that starts to, to cause uh, requests. So those are generally not in your control. So the sensors uh, are sometimes hard to plan for because you, you might add a lot of them. Um, and your analysis stack may grow leaps and bounds. But as far as your, your query stack, as a security team, you actually maintain the most control over that, if that makes sense. So, and to wrap all that in, there's a lot of argument on build versus buy. I've been on both sides of this offense before I actually joined a passive DNS company. Um, at the university, uh, I tried to build a system like this. It was really based around trying to find DGAs. It was back in the time of the Black Hole Exploit Kit, uh, giving everybody Zeus, right? 2012-ish, 2013-ish. 
Um, so we tried, you know, we tried to build this because, you know, um, universities have ginormous budgets for security teams. Um, you know, we're famous for that. Um, no. Uh, so there are reasons to build it, i.e., you don't have a, a super tight timeline that you have to deploy this in. This is not something that is uh, burning the CISO's ears by any stretch of the imagination. It's just a nice little thing to have. So if you get it running sometime in the next year, it'd be really cool, right? Um, you have limited needs for passive DNS inside the organization. You, you're, you're doing it for um, maybe monitoring and operational reasons more than you're doing it for security reasons. Um, and you might want to build it because you have a lot of expertise in network operations and middleware development and storage technologies and security tooling, right? Um, if you are uh, a large global bank, um, you, you may have enough points of presence to be able to do this. You may have enough hardware. You've got teams that do build a lot of middleware to interface with a lot of stuff. You've got guys who are global scale network engineers. You've got storage. You've got all the stuff in-house that you need to actually make this happen, right? And you may not want to put capital expenditures into this. You may want to put operational expenditures into it. So that might be a, a reason to build it. Um, reasons to buy might simply be a lack of expertise, right? or a lack of personnel hours. You, you, you can't get the internal funding to actually do the operational expense of paying developers, paying network engineers, ordering the equipment, whatever it is. Um, you need larger visibility than what your internal organization is. You might be a 50-person company um, that, is, that, that has valuable data, and you want to look at threats at a global scale, but you don't operate at a global scale in a sense of your network. So uh, that's another set. Or your time to operationalize is really tight. So if your CISO comes in and says, well, we've been given you know, these compliance mechanisms that has to come in, and you know, this has to be operational within two months, generally, you're not going to be able to build it and operationalize it in two months. Not only that, even if you do get it built and operationalized in two months, you're probably not populating it with enough data to make it effective in two months, right? Because that's the other part of this is it takes time to get the queries and, and put them in and, and make these things effective to see the change over time. So um, this is a really good break point for any questions, comments, concerns, observations, dissertations, or hallucinations. Yeah? How would you describe the data? It would be, be primarily timelines. Uh, uh, what kind of data storage? Graphing, uh, graphs, what so, back end would you think fits this data? Um, my back end is Elasticsearch. It's, it's a large Elasticsearch cluster, right? Um, Does this look at all like time series? Yes and no. <laughs> so um, the next part that we're going to go to is the operational flow of collecting, storing, and, and, and doing that. So I think some more insight will be gained there. Yes, it looks like time series from a sense of here's an event that happened and I put a time stamp on it, right? But the thing is, is if I see a DNS query for myexample.com that resolves to 100, 100, 100, 100, right? And four minutes later, I see that same query go in. One of the things that I'm going to do for you is I'm going to tell you the original date that I saw it. And each subsequent time that I see the exact same data, that comes back across the wire, instead of trying to insert a new record so that you get thousands of these with individual dates, I'm going to continue to keep my first scene on. I'm just going to update my last scene record, right? So in that sense, it's not going to be a time series um, set of data. I'm going to have a first scene and a last scene date on it. Does that make sense? Yeah. If this was a, a, a low capacity uh, operation, say a small office, uh, is this the kind of thing you could push into Prometheus? I'm not familiar with Prometheus, so I don't know. I, I, I can't answer that question for you, sorry. Um, if it's a small office, you could put it in SQLite, more than likely, right? It's, it's small. It's, it's DNS. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess if it's small office, you could probably do it in flat files if you wanted. But, um, OK, <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't recommend it, though, just being the fact of, um, memory intensity of trying to keep 
pointers and, and, and locators to which file that event first happened to. Otherwise, if you're going to store it in flat files, you're probably just going to store a new record for every single query you hit. And then the other part to that is then you're going to have to have some kind of an index to know which one of those files that this particular record happens to be within, right? Or otherwise, every time you issue a query, you're going to have to read the entirety of all of your flat files. Yeah, the, uh, the reason I ask is that uh, Prometheus would uh, be used in a containerized environment, and maybe the analyzers would also be uh, like in uh, Kubernetes or something. And, uh, that way. Yeah, but you don't necessarily, I mean, you can containerize Elasticsearch very well, right? It runs happily in containers. You can, you can containerize a single Python script and have enough of a kernel and enough of the Python to run that and push that out as containers. I don't, I'm, and I'm not knocking Prometheus because I don't know anything about it. I, I just, I, 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 I don't think flat file anything would be the way that I would choose to do it even at, at small scale. And that's just from query time, right? And the complexity of trying to maintain where those, that data is. The other thing is by using Elastic, you can build indexes on the fly. So you can start looking at different things. So you're talking about a small office. But maybe, for instance, you're, you're worried about a nation state changing DNS on you. So you can now see that your office in this country is getting different DNS records for Google than the offices in all the other countries. And oh, by the way, those IP addresses don't belong to Google. Maybe there's an issue somewhere. Right? So you, there's, there, there, I'm yeah. sure you've got more than two ways of looking at your data. Uh, by you, there's any number of ways, like right. I mean. We provide a, the num any number of fields, right? We provide both the date, you know, we'll, we'll start it, you know, from left to right, if you will. Um, what was the domain that was queried? Just, just the, if you will, the public suffix part of it. I don't care what all the host name or the subdomain pieces of it. What were the, the what was the, the public suffix domain, whether google.com or att.com or whoever.com, right? So you've got that. Um, then what was the question asked? Uh, that contains the specific host or, 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 or record that's, that's there. What was the, the, the type of record that was asked for? When was it asked for? When was the first time we saw it? And then where's the latest time we saw it, right? Um, what was um, the value of that record? If it's a text record and it was an SPF record, obviously I've got the SPF value in there, right? If it's an A record, I've got the IP address that comes back. If it's a quad A record, we've got the IPv6 address that comes back to it, right? Um, there, there's a, a bunch of that that comes through, and then you can, uh, I probably should know off the top of my head all the fields that are there, right? And I just, I'm, I'm not looking at it, so I, I seem to forget it at the moment. But there are a number of different questions. So one of the things that you can do is, um, I want to look at this data from, you know, January 1st to January 3rd because I thought some event happened at that and I want to only, I want to, you know, limit the size of it. Or I want to look at a particular domain, but I only want to look at text records for that domain and, and see what that changed uh, in over time. And I mean, there's, there's a thousand different ways to do that. And then the other part is, ideally, and part of the reason the company is called Open Source Context is, a DNS event that I answer to you doesn't inherently make any judgment whether it's good or bad, right? It's, it's a statement of this is what happened, right? So the whole point to this is that we can add context to other tools that can help an analyst actually make heads or tails of it. Because if you, if I issue a record for your, or a query for your domain, right? And I go back into my system and it comes back and it tells me this was the IP, 100, 100, 100, 100 was what came back, right? I can't tell you whether that is good or bad. I can then go and do more who is look up and see if the ASN comes back to you know, your company or whether it's a cloud environment that you're hosted in and, and that's proper or not. But the DNS record itself doesn't inherently say anything other than this is something that happened. So what happens at that point is you can bring it back into your SIM or any other of your data analysis and triage tools, whether it be Splunk or whether it be QRadar or whether it be your ELK stack. And when an event that doesn't meet normal conditions happens, right, and there's an IP or a domain event in it, you can issue a query back at my service and I will tell you, well, these are the results that I have and this is what it is. And you can see it changing over time. 
or one of the other things that, and we'll get into it, it's in my blue team scenarios, is um, I'm going to query for my domain every 30 minutes, right? And the first time I do it, I'm going to get an entire storage set of what my records look like. And 30 minutes later, I'm going to issue that same query. Did anything change? Nope, it's all the same records. Great, it's all the same records. It's all the same records. It's all the same records. But next Tuesday, a new host name shows up that I've never seen before, and the security team had no clue that that host was ever there because a development team is standing up a new web application and decided to make it more public than they should have, or they did make it public, they just didn't tell the security team that they were doing it. They had all the, the right authorizations, but nobody knew it was coming out, right? So, um, it's not, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good or a bad event, but it's, con, you know, it's, it's adding additional context to a question. <laughs> Depends on your environment, right? <laughs> um, so the flow. Everything starts with a DNS query, right? So we issue a DNS query. The sensor sits beyond the... Uh, the DNS resolver at this point, right? It sits somewhere between the resolver and the edge. So the question is, is this a resolver cache miss? If it's not, the process is complete primarily because the sensor shouldn't see that, right? If you've already got that query cached, your recursive resolver didn't need to go up the next level, right? So there was no query issued externally. The client got a response. Your passive DNS system never saw anything. Process over, right? However, if there, if, um, oh, I got my yes and no miss. It, if it was a miss, right, we come out and we ask for a matching response, right? Um, my sensor saw this. Here's a query. Do I have a matching response yet? Nope. I'm going to loop back. I'm just going to wait, right? I'm going to wait for my matching response. At some point, if you never get a matching response, you're going to have to put a timeout in this process, and you're going to have to handle that exception in some way, shape, or form. You may store it, you may not, you may, you can handle it a thousand different ways. That's that's based on how your organization chooses to deal with it, right? But at some point, there's going to have to be a timeout in this so that you can flush it, whether it's I don't know, 60 seconds or, or five minutes or whatever it is. But you've got a timeout event. But within that timeout, if I get a matching response, right? I have to now issue a query to my data store. And I need to issue the query to my data store and ask the question of, do I have an existing value um, for that domain or for that query? And does it match? And if, it, if I do, if I have a perfect match on everything other than this is a new query, then we just need to issue an update to the time on that record of last seen, right? And that's the complete process. If I don't, I need to issue a new record and take all of the metadata that's contained within that query and request and insert that record into the data store. And that is start to finish kind of how it happens as far as getting the data into the data store. Questions on that? So is that, that would be your engagement with, say, me as client. No, that would be my engagement with my company, right? With all of my sensors that are around the globe, that is the flow that happens out at my, my sensor set. We retrieve a DNS event, and we send to the analyzers the DNS metadata. And the analyzers say, OK, here's my DNS metadata. And they issue a query at my data store and say, have I ever seen this before? Oh, I have seen this before. Here's my timestamp on it. Go update, please. No, I've never seen this before. Here's all this data. Please go insert a new record, or I pass it off to a different process that goes in and makes that, um, right? I queue it for a, a larger operation set and, and, and repeat the process. So if you got, um, I, I imagine a lot of the yes traffic on the final stage uh, might be covering for cache that's timed out from your result. Exactly. So one of the most frequent queries we're going to see is something for Google, right? Um, and I keep going back and using them, but <laughs> I learned in this job just how many queries a day that get issued for Google. It is astounding um, how much relies on them. And I'm not just talking about you going to search. 
the number of DNS queries issued to Google on any given web page for just their analytics piece is insane, right? The, the googleanalytics.com piece or, or the API dot whatever. J just, just the Google services, the amount that gets issued, and even though their timeout, I mean, well, you may or may not respect their timeouts. I think Google has a timeout of 300 seconds or maybe even 3,600 seconds on those, right? On that record, like I've been messing around with DNS on my own network. Yeah. And blocked one of the Google APIs. Yeah. And let YouTube run, over, run overnight, and it was 72,000 pings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's in like 12 hours. Yeah, it, it, like, and, and I didn't even, and I've seen this at scale, right? I worked for Hospital Corporation of America at one point, right? A little tiny hospital company of like 160 plus hospitals, you know, hundreds of thousands of endpoints. And I'm like, oh yeah, we issue a lot of, of DNS requests to Google. I still didn't really understand um, the scale of what Google uh, does as far as, as receives in DNS requests until I came to work here. And just to process, like we dedicate dedicate specific resources just to the Google stuff because there is so much of it. And part of it is, I'm not saying that you're not going to find bad things in Google from time to time in their cloud services or other things. Like you do find stuff in, in Google land that isn't good, but primarily, um, uh, statistically, it's a safe bet that if it was to Google, it was at least some form of legitimate traffic doesn't necessarily say you wanted to do it or not. You may not want to give them advertising information or, or, or ad click information or whatever it is that they're capturing. But as far as nefarious, um, there isn't an ill intent on Google's part, right? Um, so if I'm going to, if, if I'm engineering a system and I want to be able to um, always handle, I don't necessarily engineer a system that is constantly handling my peak flow. Right, because that may be five times the cost of, of engineering a system where I can shunt Google off to a different Kafka topic, right? And I can devote less processing resource to Google during a busy time and devote more process to other stuff and then come back in less uh, times of less uh, uh, busyness, right? And devote more work towards the Google stuff and catch up, right? So um, I, I just, in the way that we balance stuff, and, I, and I've heard our engineers talk about things, um, I, I didn't understand until I came to work for these folks just how many DNS requests a day get issued globally for Google. It's, it's, I don't know the number, but it's, it's insane. It's a lot. And if you think just 1% of it, which is probably close to accurate, 1% of what I issue is to Google or Facebook, right? Um, on an average network, and I'm looking at 10 million a second. <laughs> That's what 100,000 a second just to, to Google or Facebook. So I mean, it's it's just it's really it's a lot um, that it's there. So um, I don't even remember what your original question was, but I know I got off on a tangent. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, Kafka is Kafka is, is a great tool for being able to to. I call it queues because I came from the rabbit and queue world in a previous life. I, I make a lot of Kafka administrators angry when I say queue and not topic, right? I, 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 I don't drink a flavor of Kool-Aid on one tool or another. It's just a, a tool. But uh, I've made plenty of Kafka administrators uh, crazy by calling it a queue. But um, one of the great things that I found about Kafka and, and being introduced to it is um, it scales really, 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 really well. Right, it's, oh, well, I've got one Kafka server that's overloaded. Okay, we're gonna throw two more Kafka servers at it. And it's like, who said anything technologically, you know, sorry, sufficiently technologically advanced is indistinguishable from magic? Was it like Arthur C. Clarke or something like that maybe? But to me, Kafka is almost one of those magic things because I've played with it in some lab environment. It's like, oh, I'm overloading a Kafka machine. I'll stand another two up and I'll just tell them that they exist. And like it magically load balances everything and makes people have, it's, it's really, it's, it's an interesting tool. Um, it's not the only one for it. There are a thousand of them, right? You can use RabbitMQ or any of the other or type messaging protocols. But um, if you're going to do this, I would recommend standing some kind of a layer like that in front of it because then you get a lot of flow control and granularity over what you're looking at and how you're looking at it. 
Um, and the other thing that it allows you to do is dynamically um, add or subtract resources um, based on what your goals are and what your capacity is at the time. Any other questions? I'm running like way ahead of schedule here. Um, so passive DNS for blue team. So I told you I was going to tell you how passive DNS works. And I think I've done an OK job of that. I, I don't know that I've done the most detailed job of it. And that wasn't the goal. But I think I've done an OK job of saying this is what passive DNS is. So let's talk about why and how we would use passive DNS. So I mentioned this. Uh, earlier, which is the external monitoring um, of organizational DNS zones, right? What does, what does my DNS infrastructure look like from the outside world? I think people get wrapped around the axle sometimes of, well, we'll just go dump our DNS zone and that's what it looks like. Well, kind of, maybe. I don't know what does the world think it looks like, right? And that's where a passive DNS tool that's external to your network can actually help you. What, what has disparate networks across the globe seen that matters to your organization? And um, I've, I've talked to organizations where, you know, I, I go in and they're, they're curious about our service, so I, I fire it up, right, and I pull it out, and I, I say, okay, show me everything for the last seven days for this particular domain. And we pull it up. And a security team goes, whoa, whoa, whoa what's, what's that record? And it's a record that they absolutely knew about, but it was something that was supposed to be internally sensitive and not exposed to the public. Yet we've got you know, uh, uh, public sensors that have seen that external from the company. right? Was it somebody had their VPN connection up, and their VPN connection failed? And, and when they you know, logged back into their computer, their VPN connection timed out? And they were at the hotel, and they issued the request for that sensitive thing before the VPN came up. I mean, there's, there's any number of reasons that that can happen, but there are things like that that happen. And the other is, OK, this is what our DNS zone looks like externally. These are the records that we know have been queried externally. So if that changes, we should, as a security team, have gotten um, uh, some kind of notification that we're standing up new infrastructure that's going to be publicly accessible, right? If we didn't get that, we need to know about it. We should be expecting it. The other thing that happens um, frequently is companies run split horizon DNS, right? And I, I run split horizon DNS at home. Um, what my internal home network looks like when I issue a request for, um, you know, my, you know, uh, you know, webhost.myexample.com. If I'm going from the inside, I get an RFC 1918 space, right? Because it's all internally netted. If I issue it from outside of my network, then I should get another set. But if you go and look, that it's amazing how many people have their DNS sets misconfigured where when I can publicly issue a query for that host, not only do I get the external host uh, address that comes back, but their internal resolver actually answers that question too and gives me their RFC 1918 space, right? Um, and for example, I was looking not long ago, I issued a query at our, our, our set and I said, hey, just I want to see what comes back for 10.0.0.0 slash 8 in the last 45 minutes, right? And all of a sudden I saw Ceph, uh, Cephmon dot or Cephmon 1 dot blah, 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 Cephmon 2 dot Cephmaster dot, uh, you know, a domain. And I was getting internal queries. And it was an organization um, that had misconfigured DNS um, because what had happened is they had several branch offices. So their DNS administrator said, oh, well, um, they're not able to get to my Ceph monitor, uh, whatever it is over there or that was needed, part of a Ceph query from the external set, and they didn't have a proper tunnel running between you know, home office and branch office. So their DNS administrator went ahead and put um, you know, their private records out in the public DNS space. And their InfoSec team was obviously you know, totally thrilled about that. right? Um, but, and sometimes it's, it's things like that, and, and people just don't think. And I'm not saying that, that that may not be an incident in your network. It may be an incident in your network. If it were my company and we exposed our internal IPs, they would probably be really upset. 
I don't want to give any adversary, whether it's a corporate adversary, a nation state adversary, or um, just any, you know, uh, you know, script kitty on the internet, uh, the, the map of what my RFC 1918 space looks like, right? I want to keep them guessing on that. They shouldn't be able to, to map my internal infrastructure before they ever come to give me a pen test, right? Yeah? If it wasn't RFC 1918, or that one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how did the remote office get into the SIP service? Yeah, so they had put static routes on their router. That was like, hey, if you're going to 10 dot da 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 da, you do it via this, and then they natted it. It was uh, like the guy explained it to me um, <laughs> uh, because I, I picked up the phone and called the company just out of a, I mean, just out of being a decent guy, right? It wasn't me trying to sell anything to him. It was just like, hey, I ran an interesting query in my cluster, and I found this out, and it, it happened to be a a a, a medical company. Um, and it was a small one. Um, I'd never heard of them before, but having worked in the HIPAA controlled space before, like I know it's it, you know it's heavily regulated. It's it's a real pain when things like that happen. I I just picked up the phone and um, I actually issued out. I had a, a security chat. I issued out you know does anybody know anybody at this particular company? And I got a, a post back on one of the Slack channels that said yeah actually I do know a guy over there. And I asked for the contact information. I called the guy and he was. You know, he was really cool about it, but he didn't love the fact that his DNS guy had, you know, obviously put out their RFC 1918 space in public DNS. So they created a very fragile networking rig in order to... Yeah, when he unwind, I mean, he, he called me back and he's like, oh, I figured out how it happened. Because that was the question that I asked him, too, was, well, if it's RFC 1918, you know, your, your, inner, your ISP should not be routing that back publicly anywhere, right? And it was just simply the fact that they had... Um, whoever was out running and configuring new branches in, instead of setting up a point-to-point -point, you know vpn uh, for each of these places uh, set up static routes on, on how to get back into infrastructure and, and allowed nat rules and in this case the security team didn't actually control the firewalls it was the networking team that, that controlled the firewall so the security team had you know no clue that it actually existed maybe that was <laughs> i don't know we'll see <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Um, you can use it for typo squatting, right, and monitoring for that. So anybody familiar with the Levenshton algorithm? So Levenshton was something that I got uh, familiar with when we were looking at things like business email compromise, right, the, the, the new Nigerian, you know, uh, print schemes of, but run on businesses. And what ends up happening is you'll do things like if, the uh, we'll use myexample.com again, right? So instead of having it be myexample.com, it'll be rn example dot or y uh, example dot com, right? Because if you're in a hurry and you're not using a fixed uh, fixed space font, the rn looks an awful lot like m to somebody who's not paying attention, right? Um, and that would be a Levenshton difference of two. And um, Levenshton is simply an algorithm that calculates the, the difference in a set of strings and gives you a value. So a Levenshton dif difference of one or two to your domain can be extremely dangerous. Even three can be very dangerous. So there are tools like DNS Twist and some other stuff that are, are freely available on the internet where you can put your domains in there. And it'll say, OK, well, these would be common typos for your domains. These would be uh, common Levenshton replacements for your domains. And so you can't enumerate them all, and some of them aren't going to make any sense, right? Because it's, you know, the, the tool's doing the best it can to, to make some assumptions, but some of them are not going to be valid. So an analyst is still going to need to look at that. But you can come up with a list of um, domains that you think are extremely dangerous. Um, that if they were to get to your customers or clients or, or people inside of your organization, whatever it is, you can come up with those domains. And they may not be registered. They may not be resolving at any point, right? But um, you can protect your internal users from those by putting out a custom um, blacklist on your domain server, right? You can put an RPZ or, or something of the sort out and say, hey, if any of these domains come up, don't resolve them, right? Just CNAME them to, to null or, or 127.001. But what you can't do is control the DNS resolution of your clients or external forces of your network. 
So in order to do, whether it's brand reputation or, or, or you know, triage or whatever it is, you can, um, on a daily basis, you know, at midnight, run a look and say, hey, do I see any of these resolving? And if you do start to see them resolving, you can issue alerts and you can be proactive and, and, and you can do something about it. Whether you subscribe to a brand reputation uh, uh, and, you know, protection service, you, you can issue that to them or simply issue uh, an alert to your customers and say, hey, um, this is something that is that we have noticed. Please be careful when you do it. And obviously, um, you know, Brand reputation is, is pretty big, but as a company, um, if I were your client, I would, I would love it if you proactively told me, hey, you might receive a fish from here. We're on top of it. We're doing what we can do, but we can't, do ev you know, we can't control everything in the world. We may not be able to take it down right away. Pay attention, right? Um, so you can use that for them. Um, we talked about the signals enrichment, right? None of these events are inherently good or bad. They're just events. Um, you provide... Or, but they can provide additional context and, and overview, right? So you can alert your signals with these. So if you see um, uh, what was an indicator of compromise fired on an alert, right? Um, you can go back and you can say, well, that was either an IP or a domain that was associated with, with whatever happened in that, and you can pull the domain history for it. Um, or... Um, one of the other things that you know you can do is if you have a critical set of infrastructure and we'll say that this is the IP of my load balancer to my uber critical you know company world ending event if it goes down or has a problem uh, web service right if I'm constantly monitoring that and all of a sudden my 100 100 100 100 becomes 110 100 100 because somebody's you know gotten some DNS hijacking or something like that I can also fire an alert on that whether that event is good or bad is not for me as a, a, a passive DNS service to tell you, but I can tell you about the event and, and add context to something that's going on. And that kind of goes back down to the, uh, you know, can I, I can identify cases of misconfiguration versus attack, right? It's conceivable that 10 or, you know, 110, 100, 100 was somebody fat fingering a DNS change that was supposed to be 100, 100, 100, 100 versus if all of a sudden it was 206, 202, 14, right? That is um, definitely uh, something that is more likely foul play versus um, the fat fingered 100 to 10, right? Um, you can use it in incident response, so you know for a fact because uh, your next-gen AI antivirus malware solution platform of whatever so choosing you, you've, you've deployed for compliance fires off and says, hey, we've got a problem here, right? You can use um, additional lookups um, to make a, a, a set of determinations and incident responses to where what that traffic looked like over time and, and where it went and the like. And you can also use it f in some degree for actor attribution, right? So we all have seen the case where we get um, a generic malware event firing, right? And, and it's, you know, Trojan.a gen 4 and then you see a, a Trojan B Gen 6. It's two different pieces of malware that were targeted at two different systems. Maybe one was targeted at an exploit that only existed in Windows XP. The other one was targeted at an exploit that only existed in Windows 10. Who knows, right? There are a thousand different reasons that that could happen. However, they all came back to the same infrastructure, right? So seemingly unrelated events because they were two separate pieces of malware tied back to the same infrastructure. If that's happening over and over again, it may not guarantee that, but it can add some context in that you're dealing with a common threat actor that's deploying these things at you. Any questions about how else it could be used in Blue Team or comments? I'd, I'd love to hear if you have more and different use cases for it. The red team and pen testers, right? Um, if I'm going to pen test an organization that is really misconfigured, uh, you know, their split horizon DNS, I'm going to have a pretty good time when I've already got their infrastructure mapped before I ever showed up. Or I may even say, me as a pen tester, I'm going to add value. I'm not going to give you a pen test yet because you've got some things that you have to fix that are critically wrong before I ever come in to pen test that, right? And um, so, uh, that's, that's one of the, uh, the sets. We can enumerate uh, 
you know, internal networks from the outside. Um, when you look at things like, we use, I guess we referred to it as shadow IT. Everybody's familiar with that, that term. I went out and got a Slack channel, or I went out and got some, uh, the, the development team that was doing dev got some cloud-hosted log solution because it was taking infrastructure team too long to stand them up a new you know, syslog server or whatever it is. And it was named my company dot whatever hosted solution dot you know, their TLD, right? Um, so you can go out and you can look for things like that. If you're going to pen test a custom, uh, company, you can look for it as a blue team too to potentially find you know, my company dot slack dot com because somebody set up an unauthorized Slack channel because you know the Microsoft link server that you know everybody wanted to use didn't run properly or, or whatever it is right um, so you can look for those kinds of things um, and, and it's interesting because how many times do we hear of attacks that didn't actually happen directly at a company it was a third-party provider right it well, it was it it was the target hack where it was their HVAC provider that had some you know crazy set of access back in and it hit their PKI environment and it was it was a mess right but it wasn't target themselves that actually got targeted it was a third party provider so if they're enumerating your company in those third party providers right your pen testers got to broaden the scope of how they attack you and you can't necessarily control the weaknesses in your cloud providers game so um, you can identify patterns of infrastructure change to try and mimic or successfully take over or redirect, right? So um, if you've seen a common stepping through IP address space within revisions, so um, there are companies that don't, you know, instead of standing up um, a, a new web app in the exact same IP, IP address space, instead of using 100, 100, 100, 100, they use 100, 100, 100, you know, 101. Um, for their next iteration and 102 for the second and 103 and if you can see those stepping through in progressions um, if you're an attacker it's it's feasible that I could try and stand up something at the 104 address if I can and get that over right and make that happen um, the last point and we'll go back up but I can also enumerate naming conventions right because if I see critical server one critical server two critical server three critical server four if I want to do some kind of a social engineering or physical attack um, set I can call up your support team and say yeah I'm so and so and I'm standing up critical infrastructure three dot whatever um, or critical infrastructure seven it's the next you know server in the, in the name or I show up at your data center and I say I'm the technician from if you use you know HP servers from HP uh, I was sent here to change the memory because there's a you know a problem on some you know super critical domain set because I know that that exists and I have you know, done some research and I figured out that, you know, you're an HP partner, so it's more likely that your servers are HP. It's also very much likely that either the receptionist or the dude that's, you know, standing out smoking a cigarette next to your data center door is going to go, yeah, come on in, right? Because I've got enough information that I appear to be an insider. Um, and you can just map large portions of infrastructure without ever touching the target infrastructure, right? So, um, I, I know that in the past, uh, I've talked to organizations where they were tipped off that a pen test was coming because the pen tester, the first thing that they did was in map a whole range of hosts, right? I issued very no they issued very noisy in map requests and it, it didn't look right. And well, is it scanning? Well, we're about, oh, it's about time for our, you know, biannual pen test. And um, it wasn't a very good pen test, right? Because the security team was, was tipped off instantaneously um, to something that may or may not have been a real world attack scenario, right? Um, so they had, you know, oh, well, the pen test is coming from over here because that's what they're, you know, that's where they're in mapping me from. Um, so one of the things that you can do is actually just see what you can find out about a host before you ever even issue a query at their DNS or their infrastructure in any way, shape, or form, right? You can be um, vaguely invisible or, or roughly invisible to that, that point. Um, so there are lots of different um, uses in a red team um, that you can use uh, passive DNS for. And then researchers frequently use passive DNS, right? 
what did the malware do over time? What were the tactics, techniques, and procedures, the TTPs of, of this particular crew? It went from this bulletproof hosting service to this bulletproof hosting service to this bulletproof hosting service, or they started at DigitalOcean, who found them within six hours, and they went to Azure, who found them within another six hours, and then they went to Vulture, who may or may not have found them. Um, whatever it is, right? And I'm not making uh, statements about the quality of anybody's hosting uh, o over others, but um, mapping uh, what happens uh, to these things over time. Um, you can identify and potentially decode DGAs. So if we went back to the, the PDNS flow, right? We ha I said, you know, you have to have that timeout and you have to have that error handling somehow. So if we go back to the black hole exploit kit and, and Zeus, it was famous for the flak fast flux DNS and, and very short TTLs and it would change um, the IP frequently. Um, it was also famous for the fact that it would look for several hundred domains across a day, but they would only register one or maybe even two of them, right? But if you wanted to find the seed, for all of those domains and potentially undo their DGA and be able to prevent it going forward. If you're storing all of those requests, even the ones that don't necessarily get a response and maybe even very specifically flagging the ones that don't get a response, it is feasible that with some smarts and some computational power that you can back, you know, reverse engineer whatever the seed or, 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 or set that they're using to, to generate their DG, DGAs are and not only just protect your organization, but um, as a researcher, you can issue alerts and, and protect the broader internet against it, right? So oh, there's that. Um, we covered it a little bit um, in the blue team, but the attribution of disparate events based on common infrastructures or techniques, right? It may be two completely separate pieces of malware um, that are reasonably well encoded so that you don't get great looks at the internals of the malware. However, they happen to always kind of come back with the same methods of operation, you know, in the network side of things, or they're always coming back to the same cloud hosting provider or whatever it is. You can frequently, um, without actually having to reverse engineer uh, their actual code, you can bring that back and, and potentially map what is seemingly disparate events um, to, to that set. And then a global view of DNS. What does, what does, who uses Akamai, right? Or, or I don't know, I don't know any, there's an, any number of questions that you might want to ask as a, a, an academic researcher um, about how the internet works. Um, and one of the things that you can do with passive DNS as opposed to trying to buy a VPS in every country or set up infrastructure at every country, you could, you know, buy access into a passive DNS service that has that already for you and issue queries. Um, that's a much, potentially a much easier and better use of your time and money, right? So there's that. And at this point, any questions, comments, concerns? So you mentioned with previous ESA and stuff, are you, t are you pulling or capable of pulling uh, other networking information so we can see, okay, what ASN, what is BGP showing as owning this particular IP at a particular time in a particular region? Yeah, so I'm not, I don't, I don't own that product in any way, shape, or form. So I'm, I, I learned about it very recently. Um, I can get you more information if it's something you're, you're, I'll get you more information from an academic standpoint regardless, right? Not as a sell, as, as what it really looks like. But commercially, if you're interested, I'll also get you more information. Um, but yes, um, as my understanding and, and the brief conversation that I had with the engineer about that is that um, we do actually, basically it's, it's passive DNS, but instead of DNS, it's, it's BGP. So um, you can detect ASN hijackings and misconfigurations or whatever. Um, and if you think of old looking glass, right, their, their looking glass servers are starting to kind of go away um, to some extent. But it's looking glass, but instead of being current, it also has the, the historical values on it as well. Yeah. Um, would you consider uh, passive DNS to be uh, sort of a prerequisite if an organization was going to uh, put a field uh, on RPC? Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, response policies in them? And um, could you talk a little bit about uh, whether uh, policy, things like that? Uh, 
Sure, I'm not going to consider passive DNS a prerequisite to anything, right? Because I will tell you that passive DNS is not basic blocking and tackling. Right? So before you go out and you try and either build or buy some passive DNS solution, um, you need to get like your SANS 20 critical controls or you know, your OWASP or, or what other checklist that you have. Like you need to get that in order long before you ever consider passive DNS. Right? Passive DNS is, is several layers of maturity up. And no, I would tell you that um, using commercially and freely available RPZs are probably the first steps, um, or are some of the first steps that you should take in getting your DNS under control before you put a hunt team together and, and try and find insider threats or, or internal sets. Um, so there are a number of companies. Um, I'm, I'm working on, I've got an RBL right now. That's the product that I actually recently produced. So we produce a, an RBL that you can attach to Spam Assassin or um, uh, your proof point appliance or anything that supports um, you know, a, a URI based RBL. And Mine is simply, I would tell you that it's statistically dangerous to communicate by email with any domain that has just started resolving in the past two days. Right? Anybody disagree with that statement? I won't make a statement that it's good or bad in any one of those domains that pop up. It's just that the first 48 hours of a domain None of your other security tools have any reputation built for them. Um, they may be fresh malware domains. They may be fresh lookalike domains. There, there could be any number of things that are there. And nobody's had a real significant chance to make a decision um, about that. So I publish an RBL that says any domain that I've seen for the first time in the past 48 hours um, goes in this zone and you can query that, right? And say, okay, I'm not going to accept or allow email to that domain. There are plenty of good domains in that. You know, it, that it's the cost of kind of doing business. It's just that we can stay. And um, John Bambanek, who's a, a friend of mine, um, and a really, really excellent topic, or a really excellent researcher on the topic of DGAs and, and um, you know some of how bad a domain is and when it hits uh, certain spam lists and everything else. John can can talk to you about that for days, and he's really smart about that. Um, and and he's he's shown me the math and the and the research that that back that up to the point of where um, I convinced my bosses that I think it was a very bad idea. And then we did some looking, and we found that statistically it is a very bad idea, and that you're probably not going to cost. Um, yourself large amounts of business by blocking those emails, right? So that would be something in the first part of that. You don't have to subscribe to a full-on API access to a passive DNS service to get those and put those on your mail appliances. And there are other feeds that you can do for RPZ um, to do the same thing. Um, just for the room, uh, could you explain uh, RPZ and how they uh, would fit in with uh, DNS infrastructure, uh, just in general, not just kind of. Sure, I'll, I'll walk you through it start to finish in bind because it's really easy. Um, right? And it's roughly the same whether you're going to use power DNS now. If you're using, I, I don't know much about unbound, but I know that a lot of people use unbound and DNS mask for uh, that, but I, I, I don't use them much, so I don't know much about them. But for bind, you can walk in and you can literally define response policy zone. Right? And you can tell it what the name of the zone is. And then you can go and build a zone file for the response policy zone. And it looks very much like any other um, zone file. It's got you know, uh, a, a host or a domain. And generally, you're going to have fully qualified domains um, in this. right? But you've got the host and domain. And you can either issue an A record of 127.0.0.1 or, or any other non-resolvable sync uh, type sinkhole res uh, address, right? So you could issue it 10.0.0.1, and you could have a listener in your network that anytime something touches that, you know that it had an RPZ violation, and you may need to look at it, right? Or um, you can simply C name it to like dot, right? So in bind, if you C name a, a, a record to dot, that is a response policy zone. It just issues an NX domain response, right? That's its d default encoding for that. Um, so a response policy zone, um, Paul Vixie, I believe, was the person who really 
kind of pioneered this and put this out and you know may know Paul Vixie from Vixicron or um, formerly of ISC, one of the maintainers of a root server for a number of years, one of a large contributor to Bind um, oh, as software. And Cricket Loo. <coughs> Say again. Cricket Loo. He was the other contributor. Okay. I, I, I know Paul, and that's that's why I'll give him where. But I believe that he was the one who kind of came out with the RPZ concept, right? Um, and he referred to it as DNS firewall, and I can't remember whether it was Black Hat or DEF CON that he presented it at, but it was one of those a number of years ago where he kind of rolled out the concept, and um, that is. That's actually RPZ, and it's almost in its entirety, right? It's it's not really even an overview. That's how you would get it done. He. Um he recently made comment on the uh, unbound uh, uh, list of offering up uh, RPZ uh, to anybody who would send traffic his way. Um, I don't know if uh, that's an interest to yours. But it was. Uh, it's interesting to me as me standing here behind this podium as a Linux user and as a person who runs a network, I'm going to like make the same disclaimer though that um, Paul offers some competing services through Farsight TNS to me. Um, so I, I don't want to anger anybody, him or my employer. I'm going to say that Paul is a great guy. He's a smart guy. Um, he has come up with some amazing things. Um, and fortunately, Paul is a person that um, has contributed back to the community to allow um, other commercial operators and non-commercial operators to, to um, uh, gain benefit from his ideas. Yeah, the, uh, the thread was basically uh, started with a question about whether Unbound uh, had uh, the ability to use RPZs and um, the, uh, the responses were that, yeah, it could be that it's not part of the core product, from what I understand. Um, and uh, part of the response was uh, sort of the, and you know, if you want that kind of service, we do that. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I can't comment specifically on Unbound using it because I don't use Unbound as my resolver. Um, on on mo any cases that I've, I've stood up, I either use Bind or PowerDNS. Um, and Power DNS is Power DNS, uh, kind of a pair with Unbound. I, I don't, I, like, I don't, I don't know. I haven't used Unbound, right? I, I, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. The the draw for me and having used Power DNS a couple of times is that it will use a SQL backend, right? And you can make zone file changes without having to reload them. And if you're reloading very large zone files, like I will tell you that the that 48 hour zone file that I I maintain um, ends up being several million domains. So we're adding anywhere from one to one and a half million domains every 24 hours to that list. So it ends up being somewhere between two and a half and three million um, entries on any given day um, that I maintain. And I'm running a fairly large bind server um, that, ha that is well resourced. It still takes several minutes um, to reload that file every hour when I change it, right? So I have to stagger infrastructure in order to maintain, you know, uptime, right? Um, so some... You purge uh, out the old records every midnight? No, I purge out, I do this on an hourly basis. So I, I look at everything that I've seen that's new in the past hour and I add it, and anything that is now over 48 hours old, um, I purge those records, right? Um, so I, I do this on an hourly basis, and part of the reason that I chose to do it this way is that um, I don't have to transfer a zone to you. One of the great parts about DNS is it's very fast and very efficient, right? So you don't have to try and reload those zones. It's on me to do it um, because they're very large. Um, so you can just use them and, and, and query. But uh, my, my point being is there are times where I've used Power DNS um, uh, in the past because it's a large set of zones. Uh, are, are multiple zones that are very large, and instead of having to reload, uh, fully reload zones um, with Power DNS, um, you can actually just change the SQL database. And when the query comes in, it's either in the SQL database or it's not. And then if it is, it you know responds back the value. So you can quickly make individual changes um, depending on how your Power DNS infrastructure is is configured without having to reload the entirety of the zone. And it has a pretty good, like I guess somebody's done like power DNS admin type set. There's a, a, a decent GUI if that's 
your flavor of, of working that you can, can use to administer it. Um, well, if that's it, um, that's my email address. If you want to email me and ask questions uh, of all of this, like I said, this wasn't um, my idea was not to stand up here and try and sell the Phoenix Linux Users Group uh, passive DNS. It's to uh, kind of talk about what it is and how to use it. Um, but that being said, since my employer is happy to pay me to come out here and do this, um, if you would like to talk to me about it, you're welcome to send me an email and at some other time we'll happily have a conversation. Are you Phoenix based? I am Phoenix based. Thank you. Thank you.